Hi, and welcome to the fourth in our Marketing Shift webinar series for the Integral MBA in Creative Enterprise. And um, today we have Beatrice Ben with us, and we're going to have an amazing program about engaging with your client's potential. Um, if at any time you should get disconnected from this webinar, please just rejoin through the link and or call in number given in your confirmation email. Our intentions for our brief time together are to foster connection, to seed some ideas about engaging with clients in ways that surface and integrate their potential, and prompt the sharing of experiences and thoughts. Meridian University's programs are grounded in transformative learning, an approach that highly values experience, dialogue, and collective knowledge creation. We are using Zoom as our webinar platform today, and this allows us to have each person logged into the video conference. Um, please note that you can mute and unmute your mic, and you can turn your video on and off. Please keep your mic muted unless you are called on by the presenter to share. Our presenter will be sharing her screen during the presentation. Have paper and pen close by, as we'll be prompting for you to reflect and take notes as well as raise your hands to be called on to share your thoughts and responses with us all. We'll be prompting you as we use these different activities. I'm really happy to have this opportunity to showcase our guest presenter, Beatrice Ben. She is the founder of SOMA Integral Consulting, a firm dedicated to facilitating the resolution of adaptive challenges by transforming and designing purposeful and conscious organizations while focusing on the well-being of social and environmental ecosystems. Beatrice's experience includes adaptive strategy, change management, leadership capacity development, and regenerative development. So at this point, I'm going to hand over the controls to Beatrice, and away we'll go. Thank you, Anika, and uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you to Meridian University to, for hosting this webinar and for you for inviting me, Nika. I really appreciate the opportunity. So let me share my screen. Okay, so I'd like to share some thought with you today on engaging with client potentials and this is really a work in progress for me, and I would love actually your feedback and insights. Um, I'd like to collectively uh, explore what this really means for us to engage with client potential. Um, the flow of this uh, presentation will be I'll, I'll go, going to say a few words to set the stage and kind of frame the topic. And then we'll ask the, the question, why focus on client potential? Then I'll go through the four-step process, which um, I'd like to present, and uh, you have an opportunity to practice. And then we'll end with a few uh, concluding remarks. Um, and I'm going to try to engage you uh, very often in the process. So, and feel free to raise your hand if you want to ask a question, or if you need to interrupt me to um, uh, for some clarification. But I, I'm going to engage you pretty often. So, just a few words to kind of uh, set the stage. Um, this process of engaging uh, client potential is focused on consulting services. So through this approach, you're not trying to sell a particular a product, but more a services. And um, it's also a very specific type of services because this approach um, is well suited for addressing complex uh, challenges which don't have easy uh, solution and um, challenges that may not be well defined. I often call them wicked problems or adaptive challenge or ill structure. There are challenges that are uh, often value-based and that are going to require a, a group of stakeholders and, and the client, the client team and organization to actually challenge worldviews and assumptions and beliefs. 
Um, so you can, so it's very important here to differentiate between those types of problems, again, adaptive challenges versus technical problems, which can be also very complicated, but with technical problems, usually the, the situation is well understood. And if you have the right expert in the room, they can just jump into providing technical services. So that's not the focus here. Um, there is also an assumption that I'm going to make is that um, this is your the very early stage of engaging with a client. Maybe not even have you don't have the the contract at this point, um, but you have an opportunity to have a face to face conversation with a client. This is a process that really requires uh, a conversation, and it's not something that you can do really virtually. So at this point, it's going to be very important for you to have uh, an engagement in mind as you follow through this process. Um, so, and your engagement, of course, needs to um, follow those, those requirements. Um, a past engagement is perfectly fine because you're going to be able to test how you did it in the past and maybe how this approach is actually or may have changed the way you would have engaged in the conversation with the client. Um, if you don't have um, a client engagement in the traditional sense of the term, uh, try to think of a situation where you help a friend or a family member around a particular difficult ch personal challenge which require growth and development. Okay? So, since we are talking about engaging with potential and cl engaging client potential, I think the first question we need to ask is what do we mean by potential? And then, of course, why focusing on client potential versus on the client problems? So just giving you a few minutes maybe to reflect on those two questions. And when you're ready uh, with some ideas, feel free to um, raise your hand or just take the mic and, uh, and share your insight. Any thoughts, any ideas? What do we mean by potential? With the first question first, and then we'll... Great, uh, can, can you hear me now? Yes, Claudia, go ahead. Hello, so, um, uh, well, I'm, I'm drawing a little bit on my own um, uh, experience with consulting and uh, um, approaching uh, approaching a possible client with uh, addressing potential, um, uh, the, the experience that I have is um, that they don't really see a way out. Uh, I've never really looked at, at the definition of potential in this context, but so just to sticking with my uh, negative with my own negative experience of uh, naming the problems because then immediately you are, creating a negative mindset. Um, uh, often problems, in my experience, are related to something that has happened, so it's often not current. The, uh, the reason for a problem is sometime down the line, often multiple faceted. Um, so in my uh, reflection about potential, actually, it shows a visionary state, something that is in the future and addresses a way out. And as in any conversation, if I'm not giving a way out, then I'm creating a very uh, difficult situation for the person that I'm engaging. So that's my reflection on it. I really enjoy the, the bringing the potential <laughs> in this conversation. Uh, 
so that's that's an interesting approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Claudia. So I'll, um, I think this is an excellent start. I'm going to let uh, Tiffany maybe uh, share her thoughts, and then and then we can explore a little bit more why what is potential and and why it is important. Uh, well, when I when I, can you hear me? Yes, Tiffany. Um, when I was thinking about potential, um, I was thinking in terms of tapping into the client's ability or future ability to solve whatever issue that they have. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. And then I, I think too, like reframing the issue as um, and not paying attention to the negative or making it affirmative, like making it a learning experience versus a barrier. That's uh, why we probably focus on client potential versus client problems. That's my guess. <laughs> Great. No, and, and you, your boss really are on the right track. I mean, with uh, focusing on the ability, reframing, and, and focusing on the way out as opposed to the negative. So let's look at this definition of potential. And Claudia, here's the official dictionary definition. Um, it's the inherent ability or capacity for growth or development of coming into being that has not been used or manifested. So that's the first part of it. And in a way that is a little bit more maybe uh, friendly for us, it's the way to think in terms of the gap between what something is and what it could be if the system could realize its full purpose. So if you think in terms of a human being, we all have some potential. And the potential, if it is still at the level of potential, that means that we have not yet realized it. So there is still a gap between our ability to achieve something and our capacity to actually achieve it. And so the, the focus here is going to be on finding way to unleash potential in order to allow the client or the client system to flourish and to really achieve and realize its purpose. Now, why is it better to focus on potential versus focusing on the problem? And you already mentioned um, focusing on the problem, focus on the negative which is absolutely true. And it's much better to focus on, on the way out, on the aspiration. It's, you can generate much more will and enthusiasm when you focus on something that you want to realize, as opposed to where you are kind of stuck in a system. Um, so the focusing on potential is much more generative and will be able to will help the team or the group to unleash creativity. It's a much more creative process. There is also another reason, and which ties back to what I uh, mentioned in, in uh, my framing comments, is what we are dealing with here today are very complex challenges which don't necessarily have easy solutions. When a client provide a list of problems, usually these are symptoms. Those are not the root causes of the very complex situation or challenge that the, the, the client or the organization has. These are just a symptom. So if you focus on, on addressing the, the problem, you are going to focus on addressing the symptoms and solving the symptoms. But what I'm doing here, I'm taking a system-based, holistic, whole system approach to organizational development and growth. And what I'm interested in is not addressing the symptom, but actually um, unleashing the whole potential of the system so that the whole organizational system can thrive. So the goal here is to achieve high level of performance for the whole system and not just technical fixes or symptom fixes. Does that make sense? Okay. So 
Before I get into the process, there is another question which I think is important to address. Um, this is an engagement process. You're going to use this when you sit down in the very early stage with a client to begin to understand what the client um, situation is and obviously what its potential is. So what do you think might be the objectives for that conversation, that very, very early conversation? What is your aim as, as a consultant? What is it that you're trying to achieve with this very first conversation with a client? So take a few minutes to uh, think about uh, what might be your, your desired objectives. What is it that you would like to have accomplished at the end of that meeting? It may take a few meetings, actually, but what's your aim? Whenever you're ready, Claudia, are you ready? Okay, so, um, well, for me, um, sticking what you just introduced us to about unleashing the, uh, all the possible potentials, of course, I as a consultant, if I put myself in this role right now, I don't know what their uh, potentials are. So this is, a, this is an inner value. This is something that is a very uh, uh, company internal uh, 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 elementary sense uh, that I'm, if I'm coming from the outside, I don't know this, but uh, what I would like from an initial uh, meeting with a client is so that there's a touch point towards it, so that the client has an initial feeling in his core values and uh, depending on how hard the problem is just to find the core values of what they're really, what their own initial motivation, what really makes them strive and flourish, what this really is, to just give them a glimpse of it. So almost like an embodied feeling of this. Um, so that there is a recognition that something got lost over the time, uh, may have actually never been existing. Uh, that would be, of course, unclear uh, at this early stage. Um, so this would be my objective or desired outcome uh, so that the client feels that initial um, potential, uh, maybe to frame it um, in a more simpler way. Fantastic. Uh, Tiffany, do you have anything else to add? Um, I, would, I would add that uh, well, well, my goal would be to get the contract, right? <laughs> but, um, but it would be great to get it in the first meeting. But I think... Um, I feel like the first initial contact uh, or would be to feel each other out, to get to know, for the client to get to know who you are and what you provide and, you know, for you to get familiar with some of the, the challenges that they're facing um, and to see if you're a good fit for each other. Great. Um, so, you are really uh, in the right direction here. Um, obviously, uh, yes, you are trying to get the engagement, um, but uh, in order to get there, there is, there is a process and there is probably a shift of, uh, in the mind of the client that needs to take place. Um, first, and, and probably first and foremost, it's important to build a relationship with the client. Again, you are not here uh, to engage in the transactional um, relationship. It's a very personal relationship. And so it's going to be really high touch. You want 
Um, as uh, Claudia said, you may not know much yet about what's going on within the, the client organization. So you certainly, uh, this is going to be a learning process for you. You certainly want to learn and empathize with whatever clients, uh, whatever situation the client face. And uh, <clears throat> through that conversation, you are bu building a relationship. Um, another element that is going to be really important is that most often clients come to us consultant with a big problem and they are expecting us to solve it. But as I said earlier, the very big organizational challenges that uh, the client may face, those adaptive challenges, cannot be fixed, cannot be solved. They need a different approach. They need a transformative approach. And so the shift that needs to happen in the client mind is a shift from, please, consultant, come here and solve my problem, to... I'm going to partner with you and co-create with you and learn with you and, and explore where I want to be or what I want to become. So, so the, you need to shift the client mind from a problem-solving approach to a potential-driven approach. You need to help the client start thinking in terms of his and her potential or the potential of the organization, which is something that very seldom happened. Organization clients don't think in terms of potential. They have very pressing issues to address and they want us, the consultant, to basically fix them and solve them. And the challenge in this work is going to refrain to do that, refrain ourselves to jump into solving the client problem, but instead, engage in a learning conversation to explore the client situation, um, its potential, where the client wants to be, where it is right now, um, its motivation, the core values. Um, I like what you said, uh, Claudia, in terms of getting, it, getting the client a glimpses of uh, um, its own personal organization. It's kind of helping the client step back from its own organization and start looking at it a little bit from the balcony and recognize the values inside the organization and what and the potential for the organization or the systems to become or to perform um, at a much higher level of order. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. So knowing this that this is our aim, this is our objectives, uh, what is this engagement process and what is it going to take? So I'm proposing a four-step process, not necessarily linear, but there are at least four things to achieve here. The first thing, since we said it is an uh, engagement around potential, we're all going to have to find a way to reveal the potential, to lift it up. We then need to um, help the client create an image of the system, of the organization, working at its full potential. Then knowing that there is probably a lot of reason why the client is not able to currently operate at its fullest potential, there are probably a lot of constraints. So we need to start understanding those constraints, the roadblocks. And only then, only after these three steps, can we start really engaging in a co-creating process with the client so that we can to create both the engagement, figuring out the process, how we're going to work together, and, and fully engage maybe the whole team in, in the process of transformation that needs to take place. So let's look at those four steps um, in more detail, and I'm going, I'm going to go through the, the first three steps, which are the most important ones, um, and then I'll, I'll go through uh, what they take, and then I'll give you time to reflect on your own engagement process and see if you can apply this approach and, and see what, how would you engage the client, what kind of question would you ask, and, and how this would change the, the nature of the conversation with the client. So starting with revealing potential, 
I'm giving you here a visual system tool to help you in, in that exploration. Um, <clears throat> as you know, um, living systems are nested systems. And all this approach that I'm presenting is grounded in an understanding of a system, of an organizational system as a living system. What we need to do here is to focus on three nested systems. And three nested systems is usually sufficient to have a really good holistic approach of what is going on. At the center, I have placed the engagement process. This is what you are going to do with the client. And you are here to service, to provide a service and to generate value to the client. So the second system is the client system. And obviously the client systems has its own purpose. An organization deliver value to a bigger system. It can be customers, it can be society, it can be a larger system. If, if the client system that you're dealing with is a department in an organization, maybe it's an IT department in an organization, in that case, the larger systems might just be the organization itself. So those three systems, you can really um, define them the way it makes sense for your particular engagement process and the context of the client. But it's important to have them in mind. And you're probably familiar with this, but I will remind you that in a holarchy, which is uh, how those nested systems are called, each OLAN, each subsystem, is in the service of the system above it. And this, the lower level systems, are, their purpose is to support the purpose of the systems above them. So it's like in the body, the human body, we have organs, which are part of systems. You can imagine the blood circulation, circulation systems or the respiratory systems, and all organs, the heart, the lungs, etc., are in the service of the higher level systems and then the whole body. And they are there to support those higher level systems. So with this framework in mind, with this nested hierarchy, then you can start um, developing questions about poten the potential and what, the, what type of value the client systems needs to deliver to the systems above it. So, here are some examples of questions. They are a bit generic, of course, and you'll have to customize them uh, pretty much on the fly in the conversation with the client, uh, trying to assess, and you can add more and, and change them, but you can, what you're trying to assess is what is it that the client system is all about? What is its purpose? What value it generates to the highest level system? And, and, and of course, what is potential? So, one approach is to start in the, um, large, at the level of the larger system, the system that is being served by the client. And look at that larger system and say, well, what, what does that system need? If it is uh, you know, an organization that is delivering services to, or product and services to clients, what do your clients need? What do your customers need? Um, and so, and, and what, you can even ask that question at that level, what is the potential of your client to actually thrive and what do you need to do you, the client organization, in order to help your customers better achieve their own purpose? So it's always the same question always happen at different level of the hierarchy. Then you can say, well, what is, what is the value that you're generating to, uh, to your client, to your, to your customers, to your stakeholders? And what is, what is your own purpose in doing that? What, and by, by trying to understand um, that what value is being generated, you're starting to also inquire into that gap that we talked about. Remember, the potential is the gap between what is and what ought to be. And so 
in asking the question of what is the value that you would like to generate, you're kind of trying to inquire into the big pictures, the, 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 the generate outcome, what it is that the system should do. And then you can start asking questions about, well, what it is actually doing now? And you're starting to see the gap. And then, of course, as you go through this process, you're thinking about your own intervention within the client system and going to ask, how am I going to add value to this client and, and how am I going to support it and help that client unleash, unleash that potential? So it's starting to give you some clue of what you might be able to do in, during the engagement process. So that's the first step, revealing potential. Once you have some idea of what the potential is, then you want to help the client and yourself in, in, at the same time, you want to help the client create an image of his organization working at its fullest potential. And if you notice in this slide, I use the word imagine and not imagine, uh, imagining. This is not an imagination exercise. You're not, you're not creating a fairy tale story of the client system. You are actually trying to create a vivid image in your mind and in the client's mind of what would that look like if the team, the organization was really working and performing and, and operating at its fullest potential. Describe it. Show me how it looks like. And once again, you're trying to inquire into the, if this is the image of what you're trying to achieve, how is it today? So you're always trying to, cre to create a better understanding of that gap between what ought to be and what is today. So how would it be different than, than what you are doing today? And you want the client to really start seeing that, that vision of, of the, the organization um, delivering high-level value. And, and Once you've done this, hopefully this has created already a lot of energy because this is positive. Now you're imagining a system working. That's always exciting. But you know that there is a lot of reason why the system is actually not able to operate currently in this way. So what you want to do is start raising the constraints. You want to start understanding what is in the way of the client. What is preventing the system to really do its work and achieve its purpose? And that's the type of question you are asking, maybe very directly. What's in your way? What's preventing you from achieving what you just described? What's missing in your system? What are your resource constraints? There may be also some constraints, external constraints, maybe. Um, the environment, the organizational environment. Um, there might be, this is much more subtle, but maybe the constraints is in the beliefs and worldview, the way the client organization or the team is seeing itself that is preventing it, the team or the organization to actually perform. So you want to start exploring the beliefs, assumptions, and worldviews that impede the organization to move forward. So at this point, I'm going to pause. I'm going to let you ask any questions if you have. And if not, I'm just going to give you uh, some time to reflect on your own engagement process. So, and the way uh, you're going to do it is, is um, the way I describe it. First, you're trying to uh, draw this nested system for your specific context, your organization, your client context. What would that look like? And, and then start reflecting on that, on maybe the conversation you already have. And how would you ask questions differently? What it is um, that you want to learn about the relationship between the client system, especially the client systems and the system that the client serves? And then exploring the constraints, of course. And of course, you want those questions to be very specific to your particular engagement process.
Uh, I have a question actually. Um, so while you were going um, through the uh, imagining process, which is very clear to me, um, and then over to the constraints, um, I felt, and in a way you took us there on a little journey, right? So just kind of imagining, you know, how about this be? And I felt, and I have been at this state before, so um, that then there, in the moment you're kind of exploring the constraints, how do you avoid frustration being the dominant energy in the space? Because by, by, by then you may actually come to the point that, oh, these were our original ideas, and as we've been growing, we kind of lost this, and then uh, in frustration, it's easy to point fingers, and then you know, you're losing the momentum of the potential. So I'm wondering, how do you go about to create this balance? Because it seems to me a very fine line uh, that you're addressing there. Um, yeah, that's a very good point, Claudia. And, and this is also the reason why you really want to begin at the level of potential, the vision for the organization, and, and you want to help the clients visualize, create that Im vivid image of this organization working before you raise any questions about the constraints. Because this is what you're going to use to balance that frustration um, of not being able to get there. And behind what I just explained, there is another framework which I didn't um, make explicit here, which is called a law of three. And the way this framework works is that in any kind of event or action in, in, in the world, we have things that activating forces, things that, that drives whatever is happening, and there is always some constraining forces. And what is often, um, often, what often happens is that because we don't know how to deal with the constraints, we compromise. And in the approach that I am suggesting, which is a generative approach, which unleash potential, we never want to compromise. We always want to reconcile. And in order to reconcile, there is a little trick here, and I'm going to reveal that little secret. In order to reconcile activating force with constraining force, you have to be able to see the value in both. You have to see the value in the constraint. And when you're able to see that, which is not intuitive, right? Sometimes you say, well, why would I see any value in the constraints, right? I'm limited in my budget, in, in people culture, in, in regulations and whatever. You have to be able to see the value. And when you understand the value, then you're able to find approaches that can reconcile those two forces and bring the system to at a higher level of operation. And in order to see the value, so some, some techniques is the five whys, for instance, to get very deep into the core, what does matter? Why is it so important? So, so there, you are right that there might be some frustration, but the goal is to actually understand that there is value behind the constraints. Very often in adaptive challenge, the constraints are uh, different beliefs and views from different stakeholders. The problem we're talking about here are complex problems which usually engage multiple stakeholders. And, and the constraint is that the, the stakeholders often have very different perception and, and understanding of what the problem is and, and what the solution should be in their mind. But by inquiring into why, why do they think the way they think? Why do they have the belief that they have? And what assumption they make? And understanding the value behind this at the very core, by, sometimes by asking five times why, 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 you can get to the essence of what truly matters to people. And at that level, you are able to reconcile. So at this point, I suggest you take a little bit of time to 
explore what that uh, process would look like for your own engagement or your own interaction. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll debrief. So let's see, I haven't been checking time here, but uh, I'll give you um, at least five minutes of reflection and maybe a little bit more when I, when I figure out where I am with my schedule here.
I see that Claudia might be ready. Tiffany, do you need a little bit more time? You have to uh, unmute. You need to unmute your mic. Um, I'm okay. I, I just was writing one more constraint. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> so, um, we may, since it is a very small group, we may have a little bit more time to actually discuss more specifically um, your uh, client engagement. Uh, since I was expecting a little bit more people and um, the way I was looking at the debrief was actually focusing not so much on the specific of your, of your own example, but more of the insight that you gained from doing that exercise. What, what did you learn and how does this exercise change your own understanding of your client's challenge? But in answering those questions, feel free to bring in whatever is relevant since we have uh, some time for conversation. Um, I can go first. I think that uh, the secret that you gave us that, um, well, I wasn't really clear what the law of three was, but I think it was activating force and constraints. That's and correct. Reconcile and reconciliation were the three. Is that it? That's correct. Um, okay. And I think that for me, that gave me a lot of insights uh, into um, to dealing with, to becoming aware, uh, to, I guess, into like building my own awareness uh, through trying to move a, you know, a, you know, conflicted group into valuing both their motivation and wanting something and, and what is barriers to that um, in, in a very high level complex uh, situation. And so, I mean, I could real quickly say that my situation was, um, so um, I'm still an activist in the world, and uh, uh, I'm from Guam, and Guam is a, uh, an island that is still on the decolonization list in the UN. And the people there have been really trying to, think they, the indigenous people really want to decolonize um, and become a self-governing uh, independent state. And, there are lots of constraints with that, and it's a very much a very complex, it's probably one of the most complex issues that I have ever dealt with in my life. Mm -hmm. And so I try to look at it uh, in using your, with the nesting. Yeah, so it, it's very helpful to me. <laughs> Good, and, and um, so using the law of three again you can imagine all the drivers right for this process of decolonization and then you can put in parallel on the other side all the things that people see as those constraints and then and then inquire what why do they why why do they have those constraints where do they think and so sometimes it could be a constraint in terms of beliefs that it's not going to work cultural challenges, um, it can be structural, political, I mean, but so you can add all this and trying to inquire what's the value that um, people hold when they are providing those limitations, those constraints. And, and again, and, and in many ways, this is the process of inquiry that needs to happen in order to see the values behind those constraints and then be able to, once you have the values behind the constraints, you put them in parallel to the activating force, to the motivations for the change. And, and then, and only then, can you start to see some ideas on how to reconcile. And the, the reconciliation is a transformative process. It means that different parties, different groups who may be opposing at some point are now able to see a new way of being together in a different, in a different situation with a different set of relationships. 
and they all see the value in that new set of relationships. But that, that is going to require a transformation process. So I'm, 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 glad, I'm glad you shared that example. It's, 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 yes, it is extremely complex. Um, and of course, all political problems are adaptive challenges and cultural and grounded in beliefs, deeply in history. I mean, you have a lot of history there. So, so um, and it takes time. This is, so these processes are not processes where uh, that can be addressed in, in just a few days. But again, by focusing on the potential for a new way of, of living together, a new way of, of embodying this island, a new relationship to the island itself, you may create a completely different set of, of relationship and, and, and create and, and help people see the possibility of the decolonization process and its outcome and its value. Fantastic example. Claudia. Well, um, well, thank you, Tiffany, for sharing this, and thank you, Beatrice, for, for your input. So, I ending up with a, a, a <laughs> diagram of your. Um, yes. So, um, and uh, on, uh, on, on, so I, uh, first, so this is the potentials, and these are the. Um, the uh, the things that are in the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the, the way how I've seen them. So there are uh, they might be visible on certain areas, but they're actually everywhere. Um, and so this is kind of a little bit of work. And so there was a time uh, element to it when I drew it because first I started to make those um, uh, and then I added those potentials here, and then they started to spread. Right. right? And the uh, in environment, I added this as another layer because this is actually overspending. And then I added even a bigger system circle of the circle of everything to it. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, that helped me actually to understand a little bit more how uh, multiple dimensions of complexities are actually weaving into each other. So, yeah. that's where I took it. <laughs> <laughs> And, and I think you said something that, that is very key here. It is weaving the complexity. Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a tendency, uh, and obviously you, you are in a program that is grounded in system thinking and the understanding of living systems. So you have a, a holistic mind. But as a society, we have the tendency to reduce complexity. Mm -hmm. And... and those the challenges I'm talking about here cannot be in order to to address them to resolve them you need to embrace the whole complexity mm -hmm. you need to see all the interactions mm -hmm. so you need to see um, everything that goes in the way and how it impacts the, the system or the organization of the different stakeholders and also all the different drivers, which may be multiple and, and very diverse of why people want to move forward. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you can create that map of that whole complexity and fully embrace that complexity that you can start uh, getting some insights into element in the system where you can intervene maybe or, or, or things to shift that might unleash the potential and bring the system to a different uh, state. Mm -hmm. In the process of revealing the complexity, you also need to help the different stakeholders challenge their assumptions and belief. That's part of the complexity as well. That, you know, the metaphor I often use is that we are all like blind man around an elephant mm. and each of us only we touch so we are blind and we only touch part of the elephant and and we have a very imperfect understanding and view of what the elephant is all about we need each other mm -hmm. in order to start seeing the elephant mm -hmm. and we need to start peeling the onions and 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 removing all or lenses or color lenses that are preventing us from seeing things or reality as it really is. Mm -hmm. So that, that's part of that, of that process. 
Mm -hmm. So understanding the constraints and knowing that maybe the constraints are just there because they are grounded in old beliefs and assumptions. And once you have challenged the beliefs and assumptions, then the constraints may be removed. Mm -hmm. But but I think your diagram shows that the layers of constraints at, at the organizational level, at the at the general systems level. Yes. Yeah. So so uh, there's another why 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 doing this. I actually um, uh, came on a, on another um, element of awareness in there, and uh, that made me very curious because um, if I'm able to. Uh, of course, this is a very abstract diagram, but if I'm able to kind of illustrate uh, a corporate, you know, an institution, an organization, a, you know, a country for matter, so what, where they are in all this, yeah, um, I'm all of a sudden engaging actually also in a, in, a, in a creative solution finding. And I think this is really one of the uh, biggest problems missing in, in, in our society and in, in most of our environments, so to call, is creativity so which actually brings for so many solutions and new visions and ideas by itself um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with our course program but we are uh, uh, beside Nika's course we also have a course uh, engaging really in the in the development of leadership capacities into these spaces and really using the the, the creative um, uh, elements that are part of this and this is of course also part of Nika's course really looking at, um, at, at ourselves as systems as, in, as organizations from a creative um, and uh, thankful the Nika brings a lot of playfulness into there. <laughs> so yes yeah, so absolutely so this is this work is to unleash creativity, mm -hmm. but it's, un it's to unleash creativity not as a problem-solving exercise, but as an exercise where you can visualize, create a, a, that image of the future that you want, and then looking at the potential, or all the assets that you have, and see how you can use those assets, unleash them, and, and, and maybe remove the constraints so that you can really achieve that vision. So, so I, it's generative creativity. It's bringing the system alive in a new and, and developing in this process, you are also developing new capacity and capability. I think um, uh, it's you, Tiffany, who mentioned earlier that um, the potential is related to capacity, the capacity of the system. So, so it's a, and, and remember that potential is something that you can grow by growing capacity and capabilities. So as you go through this process with a client of, of um, challenging beliefs and assumptions and 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 at the same time still painting that pictures of what the system should be then then you are helping the client develop new skills new way of working that might be new way of interacting with the different participants maybe the maybe this is the employees of an organization and they need new ways of interacting with one another Listening skills, um, ability to hold ju um, judgment, to not be too judgmental, to to accept diversity, to see the value in diversity. So all all this, of course, is part of of the process. And here we are talking. We are beyond now this very early stage engagement process with with the client. But as soon as, assuming you get the engagement and the contract, the process continue where you really need to continue to engage in that understanding of what the potential is and how can you grow that potential. Anything else that you want to share or any other insights or questions? 
I do have a couple of slides of conclusion, but I just want to give you a, a, another chance to. It, uh, it feels to me that that your approach, and of course, this is you know, the, um, the, these are all big words, but uh, that the part of what you are advocating is also really to to change a, a belief system, which has uh, so much to do with culture. And you know, as an example. Uh, that Tiffany just brought us. I mean, culture is so embedded in belief systems and so on. So if you are uh, working uh, towards uh, creating another belief system um, of looking at your potentials, your challenges, uh, and, 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 and the whole, more the whole picture, you're of course developing a different uh, internal culture, um, which, uh, and I'm not sure uh, if, if this is where you're going with this, um, and of course, when you when you have that internally, then of course you are able to just also give this outwards. So then, they're, they're often so in the way. This is our message to the outside, but you know this is our own struggle. You know they're not coherent. Yeah, um, th that's where, where where many people feel in organizations very uh, uh, unsatisfied. Um, but if you're developing a culture around uh, seeing. Seeing, uh, seeing all parts at stake, the constraints and the potentials and working towards the bigger system pictures, then you're having, of course, a very, I, I would imagine, a lasting transformation. The, so, yes, this is where I'm going and this is the goal. Okay. And this, is actually, <laughs> this is actually, the goal is to actually use the process of engagement and helping the client address its challenge as a developmental process, mm -hmm. as a process to help the client develop the skills so that eventually he doesn't need us anymore. Yes, yeah, I, that's what I uh, understood, yeah. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you, you want to, to develop those skills through the process, but yeah. there is a big difference, and the, the value in this work is that skills can be developed in doing the work itself. It's not a training, it's not, you know, a course that you're taking. Mm -hmm. You are practicing new skills by actually addressing your own challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. Mm -hmm. I so, also want to, just as I'm um, sitting here with, with this and hearing the whole conversation, I'm really thinking about how um, this change changes up the business to business marketing space also because you're not coming in to do a transaction with someone um that you're um you know <laughs> you you might not be selling them something at all you might actually help them to be realizing the potential in their own organization to to solve a problem and um so um you know it's a it's an, in, an interesting way to work, very much like some of the architectural and uh, landscaping clients that I've had um, for business coaching, where the, the, the design consultation that they're doing with people is often something that no one wants to pay for. And, um, and yet that is where a, a tremendous amount of the value is actually loaded up front. Right. And so there's this um, level of education right. that has to happen if you are using this as your methodology, um, I believe, in, in, in like uh, helping people to understand the value that's being provided um, from the very beginning, from the moment that you set foot in the door, you know, that this is not some kind of free introductory service. And then we do the real work and you pay me for that. Right. You are absolutely right, Nika. And I will go even a step further in saying that the value creation process may need to happen even before the design itself. It's in the conversation of what needs to be designed, and of course, and of course, through the design process itself. But understanding what needs to be designed, what what will generate value and what doesn't, mm -hmm. we often jump too quickly into the design in the in the solution space, 
We want to be very creative, so we want to design. Mm -hmm. But the question we need is, why? Why are we doing this design? Why it is valuable? What are we going to generate? Is it valuable to a, a large, sufficiently larger system to be worthwhile? Mm -hmm. Is it really needed? Yes. This is so on point because one of the things that we've been discussing in the last few weeks uh, in our um, class, and, and actually I um, started to venture into this in the third wave business blog that we're writing each month too, is um, that uh, innovation, whether it's to, to fix something or to have some brilliant brainchild come out into the world um, is is not necessary some necessarily something that should be implemented ubiquitously right you know that <laughs> like everything that we can dream up um, or think needs to be fixed right this moment does not ne necessarily need to be acted on and so I'm hearing that in what you're talking about here too that like you said um, going up on the balcony and looking <laughs> at the large scale uh, picture of um, context and history and, um, and you know, what's available, what's the philosophy, what's the belief systems, values, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, people often have no patience for is actually the way into understanding um, impact. Yes. Right. So, yeah. so thank you for bringing that kind of, you know, um, closing the loops on some of those things that we've been discussing too. Great, fantastic. So, so I think we're we're moving on to your conclusions at this. Yes, point. absolutely. So, um, very. I think we already talked a lot about these four steps, which is at the, at this point in the conversation, if you have helped, if you have asked very powerful question to the client about that, that have forgot to understand really deeply the systems, the value that the system is generating through the larger systems, the constraints, etc. You have started to really build a relationship and, and you have helped the client take a new perspective on its own challenge and, and, and um, struggle. So at this point, um, you should have created a lot of willingness, a lot of will in the client to engage with you in a co-creative process as opposed to kind of remove himself or herself from the process and wait for the problem to be solved. And I think that's, that's really the, 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 the most important things. It is this co-creation of the engagement process with the client and full participation because you know that you cannot address the challenge on your own as a consultant. You need full participation for, from the whole system. So that's, that's the last step. In terms of concluding remark, um, obviously this is a conversation, so it's not going to be linear, but you have to remember that there is a flow to it. You don't want to get to the constraint too early for the reason that Claudia mentioned earlier. You don't want to get to that frustration space you really want to start understanding, you want to remain in the positive side of potential and then visioning, imaging the systems working. Um, the biggest challenge is for us consultant is to resist the temptation, the temptation to solve the client problem because society in general and the environment is pushing us towards doing that. Please, come and solve my problem because I need to be, I need to have it solved by tomorrow. That's, that's very typical in business. So how do we prevent ourselves from getting into that path? And it is very tricky because clients are very good in cornering us into that direction. Help me solve it quick. So how do you help the client understand that this is not the right path? This is, this is challenging. I found it very, very challenging personally when I engage in, the, in those kind of conversation. So this, the approach is to remain in the process of inquiry. You really have to ask a lot of questions, but those questions have to be 
really good question that somehow knocked the, the client out of his uh, traditional way of thinking. You need to kind of surprise the client and say, oh, I never thought of that. That's a good question. If there is no answer to that question, that is an excellent question. And of course, it's a process where you have to learn and adapt in real time, which require practice. Having those kind of conversations are not easy. Uh, they re require us as consultants to develop new skills, to really be present, active listening, but also this ability to um, really see the system. And I want to finish with this very important question, because if, if I am right that in order to address adaptive challenges, we have to focus on potential as opposed to problem, then that raises the question, what is required for us to be able to see the inherent potential of a system? Obviously, it is requiring a system approach. You cannot see potential if you are taking a reductionistic approach. So you have to see connection, you have to see the big pictures. Like Nika just mentioned, you have to go on the balcony. You have to embrace complexity and you have to be comfortable with um, um, complexity and also the fact that because it is complex, you are not going to understand it. So it's going to be very ambiguous and, and it feels sometimes challenging and uncomfortable because you don't know exactly what you're dealing with. And you have to be able to stay in, to remain in that state of ambiguity. This diagram shows that what's very important for us is actually to be able to see a higher level of potential, to be able to uncover, as we inquire with a client, we have able to uncover a higher level of potential than what the client is able to see. Because you know that the client is not going to be able to move from where it is to where it needs to be eventually in one step. It's a development process. It's a gross process. It's going to take time. Mm. So you want to take the client to an intermediary level. But in order to do that, you need to be able to, to yourself, be able to operate at a higher level. We often say that in, in transformative work, the, the facilitator or the consultant has to operate at a, a two level higher level of complexity than the system that it is actually changing. And this is for this reason. And so that also is going to require practice. Learning, learning how to see systems, how to see connection, um, to understand patterns, to understand dynamic systems, so the fact that they change, all this comes into play when you're doing this work. So I'm gonna take this moment to wrap us up. This has just been fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. And, and I'm putting, this is my contact information. If you need to reach out and have a further question, feel free to do so. So thanks to everybody for participating. And um, this is being recorded and it's gonna go out to everybody that registered <clears throat> and, um, and also out through social media. So it's good that you have your connection information up there, Beatrice. Um, I wanna remind people who do see this video to look for public program announcements on Meridian's website, which is meridianuniversity.edu and on our Facebook page for the MBA, the Meridian MBA. If you're intrigued to know more about the Integral mm -hmm. MBA, you can register on the website for an info session each month. The next one is June 23rd, or schedule a one-on-one -on -one by phone or in person with me. You can contact me at Nika Quirk at meridianuniversity.edu. So everyone, have a great evening, and thanks again. We'll see you in the future for other webinars, I'm sure. Thank you, Nika, and glad to meet you, and good luck with your engagement process. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.